Hello, 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 everyone. I hope you all had a fantastic first day at the MRDF days yesterday. Can I see some emojis? How you like the first day? Awesome. Lots of love. I love it. I love it. Uh, my name is Rene. I'm a Microsoft Regional Director and MVP. So I don't work for Microsoft. These are community awards provided by Microsoft for independent experts. I work for Long Reply, a digital transformation company. Anyway, but today, welcome to the second day of the MR Dev Days and this fireside chat with no one else than Alex Kipman. Can I see some emojis here? All right. Alex! Hello, hello. There he Good is. morning, everyone. Hey, Alex. <laughs> hey. Well, I guess you all know who Alex is, but just in case you don't, he's a technical fellow for AI and mixed reality in the cloud and AI group at Microsoft. Uh, basically, he's the innovator behind our beloved tools like the Connect and the HoloLens, of course. And so, yeah. Hey. Uh, how's your day, Alex? So far, so good. Excited to be here. Um, had a ton of fun yesterday, hanging out with lots of folks here in the community in our social hour. Thank you, everybody, for showing up to the social hour and for just all the great energy uh, throughout the day, essentially, you know, leaning in, you know, learning, making connections. Um, so just excited. These two days are, are super re-energizing for myself and everybody on the team. So, Yeah, awesome. I also personally enjoy it day one a lot and your keynote and, you know, the networking space and so on. It feels so much more immersive having a, a conference in VR than just uh, having a 2D video call. But back to our fireside chat here. Um, you know, I aggregated community questions through, like, let's say, last couple of days, like 10 days or so, and I structured them into three different groups. So we will talk a little bit about the past, then we will move on to the present, and then the future, of course, and the visions and all of that. So hopefully we can get some, some good insights here from Alex. All righty, folks. Um, did you actually know that today is the 40th birthday of Pac-Man? Like, Pac-Man was introduced 40 years ago, which is pretty amazing, right? And we had another birthday, as you might have heard yesterday. The Hollands turned five years old, so I guess it's not too late to say happy birthday, Hollands, again. Happy birthday and happy birthday to Pac-Man. Um, we're in good company, 40 years old. I look forward to being somewhere um, when Hololens turns 40 years old. Exactly, right? That's what I was thinking. It's like, where will we be in 35 years, right? I mean, let's talk about that later. Um, so let's talk about the journey a little bit in the last couple of like five years, like we said. Um, like I have to say, before the Hollands came out, and I, when I tried it the first time at Build five years ago, I was not expecting that such a device would be already possible. And I think a lot of other people didn't expect such a quality uh, device, like with stable tracking, you know, super good displays, untethered, all of that, right? All computing done on site on the device. And of course, all the sensors and spatial computing and all of that. That is, it was just mind blowing. And so I've ne never expected it would happen already five years ago. And so my first question would basically be, um, I'm sure there were a lot of like, you know, unknowns and, un, you know, theoretically unsolvable things. And did you ever think about giving up? <laughs> uh, no, short answer. Absolutely not. Uh, I think like, honestly, one of the key reasons I fell in love with computing, I'm still in love with computing today as, as my, my chosen, you know, art form and craft is because in technology, nothing really is impossible. Uh, you know, things at best are improbable. And then with a little bit of my imagination and some pixie dust, you make the improbable pop possible. And, you know, in a sense, science fiction into science fact. Now, you know, you need to, you, you shouldn't start working on a program like HoloLens uh, if, you know, not knowing how to do something is the reason not to, right? Uh, by definition, nobody has done it before, which means the whole thing is unknowable and unknown. Uh, I mean, if you wait to solve everything, to learn enough about everything, you just can never, you know, get going. Um, so as the team, you know, started working on the process, you know, there's, you know, a lot of work is work. Um, we're, we're all engineers and we know how to schedule work and you kind of sweat. It's pure perspiration. Uh, however, there 
are, you know, quite a lot of things where where the world is, you know, um, about inspiration, you know, science required, innovation required, invention required. Um, and you need, you know, a lot of people with, if you like look at a program and you're like, my God, most of this stuff is invention required. You say, hmm, perhaps we shouldn't work on this right now. Um, and you always have to admit, you know, I never thought about giving up. But you always have to imagine that failure is an option, right? And you have to be comfortable with that, with that failure. And less about the failure, you know, um, you know, my favorite Michelangelo quote says something along the lines of the problem with most of us is not that we shoot too high uh, and miss it, is that we shoot too low and we reach it. Right. So it's about embracing failure. It's about embracing taking risk in life. Um, and, you know, in the program, we talked about these things as, you know, miracles. Um, so we start a whole program and there's a lot of engineering work. There's a lot of work that requires perspiration. And then, you know, we count in terms of miracles. Well, and there's a few miracles that need to land. Now, it could make you very uncomfortable, right? Because you're like, look, I have thousands of people working on thousands of different components. And there's this one or two or less than five miracles that make the product. And those things you can't schedule. Um, you can't schedule inspiration. You can schedule perspiration. I um, mean, it's quite complex then for you to go as a body, as a team, thousands of people again, um, when something you still have no idea how you're going to do it. In HoloLens 1, that was across the board. For example, there was tons, but we didn't know how to build the lenses. Right? Imagine you're trying to build a holographic self-contained computer. You need to do everything, electrical, mechanical, silicon, software, runtimes. And, you know, this little detail of holographic lenses or, you know, um, um, waveguides that let you see these images that you place in the world that we call holograms. Like, huh, those things we didn't know how to build. Um, we didn't know how to build until very late in the program. Um, correctly, a yield in manufacturing. That was a miracle. There were others. You know, for HoloLens 2, it's not like that goes away, by the way. The display engines in HoloLens 2, although MEMS as a technology has existed in industry for quite some time and with people and companies working on it, actually shipping it in a, in a product at quality, you know, with the requirements of drop tests and things like that, those things simply do not, still don't exist in the world. Um, and it's all, you know, invention required. And, you know, pulling that off again um, was miracles required. And as I look forward in the next roadmap, the next set of things we're working on, it does not get easier. It's not like as we look in the frontier of what to do next, we're like, yep, it's all engineering, it's all perspiration. For a lot of it, you know, we're still counting even today, as we look at the things that come after HoloLens 2, in terms of counting miracles required. Now, if you're me or if you're part of the team, that's what makes you excited, right? As soon as we're like looking at the forefront and, you know, things are commoditized and, you know, kind of anybody sort of can do it um, at that point, you know, it's that much less interesting because it's not as innovative. You're not pushing state of the art forward as much. And, and, you know, to the point that Pac-Man just turned 40 years old, you know, computing as a whole is like less than 100 years old. We didn't have computers until 1940s, um, right? And even then, I mean, think about it. Those are like, you know, fancy calculators with, with vacuum tubes. Um, think about the delta in less than 100 years, right? So if you prorate forward as an industry, as an art form, as a craft um, for, you know, the next 100 years, the next 1,000 years, think about how much innovation there still is to be had. Um, it's such a nascent field. Um, so you have to keep pushing forward. And in pushing forward, you have to keep innovating and you have to keep going into unknown territories and you need to get comfortable with it or you shouldn't play the game. Awesome, yeah. Is there any less known hero feature of the HoloLens most people don't realize took a lot of engineering effort? Hmm. Uh, there are so many. Which one to choose from? Uh, you know, look, again, there's thousands of components inside of HoloLens and the craftsmanship for the team to be able to create this beautiful self-contained holographic computer. Um, there's just a ton. Um, let me pick one that I don't think anybody knows. Um, why? Because it's not an external feature, but it's such an important feature. Um, let's, let's see, raise your hand if you know what the debt sensor is on HoloLens. Nobody. Yes. Yeah, so you probably work on the team. If you see <laughs> some people on the team in the audience know. Um, so the DAT sensor is essentially um, a sensor that's inside of HoloLens. Um, that stands for our display alignment tracker. 
Uh, I mean, it's essentially a computer vision camera uh, that doesn't look outside into the world to be able to understand environment, people, or things. It looks inside a HoloLens um, so that it can keep uh, all of the the sensors uh, well related with each other, but more importantly, the display engines, right? You know, a lot of people, it's back to like, if you think about MEMS as a technology, MEMS is the technology that, that makes the display engines of HoloLens, um, HoloLens 2 work the way that they do. Again, MEMS have existed in the industry and there's companies out there that have MEMS. But the problem with MEMS is they're mirrors. You're shining laser through mirrors and, you know, um, at some very high frame rates to a essentially create the image on the display by squirting, you know, on a mirror, a single laser that then spreads them in the horizontal. And then you shine that on another mir mirror that spreads them in the vertical, right? The horizontal mirror, we call it our fast mirror. Uh, it needs to go at, you know, um, a very, very, very fast frame rate. And then the frame rate of the device is defined by the vertical uh, MEMS mirrors. Now, that technology, shining lasers on mirrors that move fast, exists. There's companies that do it. Um, but it's super unstable. Now, think about shaking a device, think about dropping a device, think about, you know, the way that the device morphs with temperature and time and things like that. And then all of a sudden, nothing is going to be coherent anymore. And, you know, the way that that interface interfaces with our waveguides is actually quite complex. So this that sensor um, is there to observe all of that from within HoloLens. And it's a beautiful piece of engineering created and invented at Microsoft where, you know, it's computer vision inside of HoloLens. And that workload, that little AI workload that sits there, um, essentially looking at all of this stuff is what makes all of this technology for HoloLens 2 the way we place holograms possible. Now, since I'm telling you this, this feature, you're going to be able to possibly observe it. When you boot a HoloLens 2, first on um, or within the first five minutes, you'll see some blinky lights, um, white lights outside of your field of view. The read on the bottom of the device, they'll just kind of flash really fast. It's a pattern. Um, and it's a light pattern outside of the field of view that you're like, why are they shining a pattern outside of the field of view? Um, it's because you know who's looking at that pattern? The that sensor inside of HoloLens, um, right? So it's looking at the sensors. It can project images on the waveguide. And that pattern, which is known to us, um, is calibrated at manufacturing, which means that, you know, in field, as things are moving and, and changing, we can display it again and we can kind of in real time always self-heal and self-calibrate, um, you know, and correct, for example, even even today, um, you know, we've updated the that sensor and the firmware and things that go into it to make the overall quality experience of HoloLens to get better. So a lot of our display improvements, as an example, are coming via software, via work that the that sensor is doing. Awesome. Well, I guess I'm not the only one who had thought something different when you hear that sensor. Um, that it's, <laughs> it's actually monitoring the display, not the person itself. That's so right. that's awesome. Display <laughs> that's alignment tracker. Yeah, <laughs> display alignment tracker. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the present and your typical day. Like, What gets you up in the morning and what motivates you to do the things you're doing? Um, well, uh, look, I, I, I am incredibly blessed uh, to be able to do what we do. I mean, Jesus, I have, by my, you know, my opinion, the best, most fun job in the world. So it's not hard getting up in the morning. Um, what motivates me, um, I think, is what motivates everybody at Microsoft, right? Um, we're a mission-driven company, and our mission is one of empowerment of people and organizations to achieve more. Right. Um, it's an altruistic mission that's not just words on 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 the on the wall. Uh, it is actually what our entire business model is predicated on. And in any time you can get your mission to align with your business model, then it becomes kind of a self-fulfilling um, prophecy. And um, the fact that Microsoft has aligned with its business model, a very kind of altruistic uh, mission, you know, who doesn't? want to come into work every day um, to empower a person, to do something they haven't been able to do something before, or to empower an organization to do something they haven't been able to do before. That motivates me to no end, and I think that's true for most people that, you know, um, if not all people that work at Microsoft. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's what motivates me, that, that empowerment of, of people um, in organizations. Uh. 
Awesome. Can you tell us a little bit more about your team and what technologies does it spawn? And also currently, of course, we're all dealing with this COVID-19 situation, right? And so how does it affect your team and how are you dealing with it and your team? No, for sure. Um, so our team is is spread around the world. Um, you know, uh, I believe that in essentially as a data guy, you know, uh, tree structures are not that great for passing information around. Graph structures are much, much better. So we kind of organize, you know, in that same sense, like organization in a sense is how you pass information between people, right? Um, so we're not a very hierarchical team. Um, we're not very kind of tops down or bottom up or you need to go through the tree to communicate with people. Uh, instead, we work like a graph, like, you know, think about everybody on the team being an individual contributor, going about their day um, and uh, feeling full empowerment for the mission and the journey that we are on in mixed reality. Now, in that same spirit, then we say each node in the graph should be able to be in a place in the world. Why in this day and age are we asking people to all come? This is very antiquated in my mind to think about hub and spoke as a mentality for how you set up teams or you have a hub headquarters and a bunch of little spokes and eventually everything happens um, in headquarters. Uh, in our case, it's not like that. We have nodes, right? And the nodes are where we have centers of expertise. And then we try to put all the center of expertise and center of gravity in that location. Um, and, you know, our team will go from Tokyo to Seattle and kind of every way in between. Um, for example, you know, our center for human understanding, the people that do computer vision, machine learning, um, state of the art work that will give you things from eye tracking to hand tracking to any number of things. You know, it's not all, but the majority of human understanding for my team is in Cambridge in England. Um, right. Similarly, for environment understanding, the people that figure out how to anchor a hologram over the world um, or do, you know, spatial understanding. You know, a lot of the again, we're spread. So people show up everywhere. Um, but there's a lot of that center of gravity in Zurich, um, in Europe, as an example. Um, similarly, for optics, we have optics people throughout, but the center of excellence for it is in Helsinki in Finland. Uh, and, you know, we just opened a center in Lagos in Africa, where we're doing, you know, a lot of the Azure spatial anchors work comes out of Lagos in Africa. Um, and, you know, so on. And the team is quite spread. Um, it's spread in nodes with centers of excellence that really are accountable for their conversation end to end, as opposed to having to kind of phone at home uh, to Redmond. And now because of this, you know, uh, we have been fairly distributed already. We do a lot of stuff with where, you know, not everybody's in the same physical location. Um, so with COVID, look, it's been tough for everybody. We've all had to adjust. Uh, it's a new normal, I think, for all of us. Uh, in our case, we've been, you know, quite deliberate about, you know, uh, communicating more, um, actually paying a lot more attention to, look, um, how do we over communicate? How do we give people space? All right. It's back to it's quite a spectrum that people are going through in COVID. On one hand, there's some people that are like, my God, this is the most productive I've ever been. And, you know, how do you then empower and enable those people to be that productive? In other cases, you know, think about, you know, people that are, you know, single parents um, with, you know, kids at home. You know, they're now having to do so many jobs. They have to be a teacher. They're teaching their kids. They have to be a parent. Um, they have to be a husband. They have to be a wife, perhaps, uh, you know, uh, and they have to, oh, by the way, also work. You know, and how do you build empathy into the system? Because in, there's a spectrum there again that I just described, right? You need to be empowering and embracing of the whole spectrum, but within context, right? Everybody's working hard. Um, and how do you build? And so we've been spending as a team a lot of time trying where I think a very empathetic team, but driving even more consciousness into the empathetic behavior in during these times. Um, I think there's a lot of good learnings that we've had around, hey, you know, the meetings have been uh, more equitable. I have a distributed team around the world, but like, hey, if I'm sitting at home in, physically in Redmond and there's 20 people in the room with me and 20 people online, there is an inherent disadvantage to the 20 people that are online. Um, and we can try to be inclusive. We can try to pull them in, but it's complex. Now there's 40 people online. You know, the meetings have become much more equitable. So, you know, the, you know, for example, when we go back to work, will we ever 
go do split me hybrid meetings anymore, or we'll just say, let's all go to our offices, put headsets on, and virtually meet so that we can be more equitable around the world, right? It has forced us to do even more around how do you document things so that we can build to the asynchronous behavior of hot life and say, look, maybe you don't need to synchronize. We already did a ton of this because we're across time zones, right? Um, but a lot of people struggle with putting teams around different time zones because if you create work that's bound on both sides, someone is always staying up late, um, right? And then you have people who like perpetually are having to stay up late um, at weird hours uh, to do work. That's super over a long time exhausting, right? So we, for example, pick our work items and, and our, our technical boundaries uh, within a time zone. To me, it's okay to go, say, Cambridge to Zurich to Lagos. It's okay to go, um, you know, Seattle to San Francisco uh, to Vancouver, um, but it's not okay to go Seattle to Japan in terms of how we do work, um, right? Um, so if you do it properly, you can kind of pass batons around the world and kind of create a 24-hour schedule with nobody working 24 hours a day. Um, I can, you know, log a bug in the evening when I'm going home by the time I show up the next morning, it's already fixed because, you know, people picked it up across the world and kind of fixed it. There's a new build by the time I show up again and life is good. But that requires you to be better at documenting things, right? Otherwise, you run into these FOMOs, fear of missing out. People are like, oh, my God, if I'm not at the right place at the right time, I miss that information, right? So you do have to put a lot more stuff in writing. We do a lot of document writing. We start a lot of meetings by just reading documents and then discussing them. Um, and there's a lot more, you know, wiki type action um, to really document things and make decisions as opposed to just, you know, hallway conversations. Uh, um, but, you know, again, I think um, it's tough times. Um, I think that we're all learning from it. I think there are some interesting things that will actually make us better um, if you look at it for, with that kind of lens when we go back into the new world. Yeah, absolutely. The um, the other question I oh what is that still mute it um, yeah so what what I wanted to ask you so the um, the uh, your team also does a lot of amazing AI research and is there anything that keeps you up at night and have you ever uh, put a hold on a certain project because of responsible and ethical AI considerations? Um, again, um, I, I I sleep well at night. Uh, I think that you know you do need to be, however, however very responsible, um, right? Uh, so we have, and we started probably one of the most. Uh, meaningful type of ethics team within the company with, with terms of AI. I think we're leading AI in terms of our ethics approach to the work that we're doing at Microsoft. And essentially, it's built again into what we stand for as a company. Like Microsoft runs on trust, right? Um, and trust, in a sense, in my mind, is something, you know, I tell folks often, you earn in drops and you lose in buckets, right? And think how long it takes filling a bucket uh, worth of trust with drops and then one mistake and you lose buckets. Um, so this is true about security. This is true about privacy. In the world of AI, this is true about ethics, right? And how do you create things where there's ethical behavior going in? And it's less about creating, you know, police of telling you to not do things and more about how is it that you get to a yes. So our team of ethics um, is actually consisting of, of many people, very diverse backgrounds, but there's a lot of designers in it. Because in a sense, it's about how do we design into an ethical world? Um, how do we design our products with ethics in mind to work around things? Um, but in a sense, you know, we have been, I think, uh, ahead of the curve in terms of looking at our workloads and making sure that we're quite thoughtful about how and when we allow things to show up. I mean, take HoloLens as an example. Um, there's a reason why I don't allow sensor output to go to developers. Um, it's not because I'm mean and I don't want you to be able to get sensor input. It's because, you know, um, I can't uh, guarantee that that data is not going to be used in an in a ethical way. So we don't make it available. You know, this is the premise and the birth of research. Research mode is an example in HoloLens. Research mode is this thing that allows you to get to sensor data, um, but you must put your device in developer mode. You must put it in research mode. And once you do it, okay, you can get it on your device. You did it, but you can't deploy that application or that workload in someone else's device. Right, you can't put those applications in that mode in the store, which means, uh, you know. Uh, so then you say, look, how do you enable people again, empower them to innovate, but while 
keeping people out of harm's way. Um, so I think like it's inherent into our behavior, and it must be for anybody who wants to do AI. Ethics is where you start the conversation. Um, and I'm, again, quite proud of the work we've done um, there. But yes, in every single workload um, across both our cloud AI as well as our edge AI, um, it's built with a lot of you know, privacy, security, and ethics in mind. I love that. It's it's very important uh, these days. Uh, definitely, it's it's one of the first things, right? It's considering how responsible you're working it is should be always the first thought and not an after thought. And I love That's right. That that you're doing that in your team. Um, you mentioned a recording or actually research mode, and so that is actually a good segue into some more technical questions here. And so the Hollands two supports this recording mode which is similar to the Hollands one research mode but not really because like the research mode on Hollands one allows you to give um, basically live sensor data frames yeah. and recording mode on the Hollands two only basically allows you to record it which is also great but I got a bunch of questions from different people um, that are mainly using it in uh, healthcare scenarios like think about a surgery room or something like that when I want to build their own custom tracking of let's say like a, a sphere or ball like think about some tool they want to track mm -hmm. and so they they actually used uh, research mode in Hollands 1. So long story short, the question is basically, uh, are we getting a research mode on the Hollands 2 with live data? Short answer, yes. It's just time. Um, we didn't remove it from Hollands 1 to Hollands 2 because we're like, it did not work out. We don't like it. Um, we shouldn't have it. Um, as we looked at the workload of what we need to go do, uh, is something we're super passionate about. See, previous answer, I want people innovating on the sensors. The reason we don't give that sensor data is because of, you know, again, security and, you know, ethical and privacy uh, considerations. Um, and because the launch was so enterprise driven with so many people um, that are, you know, about to deploy from, you know, pilots or proof of concepts into high scale production environments, those are not scenarios where research mode goes into and you know honestly that's where we've been for the last six months since we launched hololens so it's purely a prioritization conversation where um you know the people that have hololenses today that have hololenses too the majority of them um you know don't need research mode um because we're working with them to deploy you know at scale um so we prioritize that lower um but it's coming um, you know, as I said yesterday, you know, we've been doing a ton of work. Um, we do monthly updates to the OS. It's research mode would be one of those things. And we've done month on the month for the last six. Um, we just had a major operating system release uh, that you should all go download on Windows Update that kind of amalgamates the last six months worth of work. Um, and research mode is in there. So it's coming. Uh, if you think about the fact that now we're going to work through our backlog in July, people are going to start being able to buy HoloLenses on HoloLens.com. Um, at that point, you know, the feature priority goes up. Um, and then we, we, will, um, we will be shipping it. So short answer, yes, research mode is definitely, definitely coming back. Awesome. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, along those lines, um, regarding eye tracking data. Um, so right now, we can basically just get the user's eye gaze, right? But what about if I want to get like more lower level information, like think about detection of a blink, left or right, eye closed, you know, or even like think about let like, more facial tracking cameras and sensor data to control, well, us here, race right? so avatars, but also totally. think about access accessibility things. Like, you know, from a standpoint that some people might not be able to use their hands, right? And so if we can detect more of the facial expression, more of the eye gazing and so on, then, you know, we can build more inclusive solutions. So, uh, long story short, again, um, what about eye tracking data and you know more facial cameras? Uh, is that also something you're thinking yeah. about? A hundred percent. And you know, so for eye tracking, it kind of you guys are all going to you know have the refrain of the music with me. As far as sensor raw data for eye tracking, no, that's not coming to Hololens for those same security, privacy, and ethical reasons that we talked about. Um, so that is not in the cards for us to just give you access um, to. Um, the eye tracking information. Now, with that said, we will, con well, but unless you're in research mode, right? Um, and you get then access to all of our raw sensor data. Now, um, besides that, 
uh, you know, we will continue building APIs, so higher level conversations that give you input about the person. And the better way of thinking about it there is that how do we start fusing sensor input to give you more holistic information on the human? Um, you as a developer shouldn't totally care about, you know, um, you know, how is it that they're giving you hands or poses or where the person is staring on how they're blinking on how they're talking. You just want to know, hey, you know, at the highest level, just give me an avatar already and make the avatar realistic. And if how you do it, who cares, right? If as long as it works. Um, so we will continue to add expression. Uh, more ability for you as a developer to get access to the human, but we'll do so through some higher level APIs without exposing raw sensor data, privacy, um, or, or you know, ethical concerns on the product. Um, let's talk about spatial understanding. And right now, you know, with the current spatial understanding APIs, we're able to detect certain surface planes, like, you know, what is the floor, what is the ceiling, and so on. Um, what's the next step in semantic understanding for the whole lens, too? Uh -huh. um, well, I almost want to ask that question back to each of you. Um, you know, look, we did the beginnings uh, based on what we knew people would want to use, to your point, you know, kind of, you know, flat surfaces, walls, uh, floors, and things like that. Um, and now we want to listen. Right. Like, look, at the end of the day, you know, eventually you want to be able to recognize everything everywhere. Um, but, you know, if you think about the search space for objects uh, in the world, you know, that that list is quite large. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you think from a level of complexity, you know, put humans on complexity X, put environments on complexity like 10 X in terms of just permutations of differences and then put objects in like 100 X. Right. So um, it's quite a long list. And um, so in a sense, you kind of want to go again in priority order based on, you know, what people like yourselves need. Um, so we shipped with what we thought was the basics. Um, and now we just want to listen to the community a little bit and find out what are the key. Well, you know, if I were to ask you, what are the next five things um, that you want to have recognized? And then we're just going to start, you know, working through them. Makes sense. How can we uh, give you the feedback? Like, what's the, the best way to send it over? Yeah, I mean, it's back just through all of our different channels, right? You know, my favorite one happens to be the Feedback Hub. Uh, um, feedback Hub, to me, is amazing for people that are using the product that, you know, run into issues. It's built in right into the product. And the team is, you know, those things get logged into ADO for us automatically. Um, so anytime you do anything in Feedback Hub, it doesn't go to nowhere or Microsoft. Um, it goes into our, our, you know, developer database. We use ADO um, and DevOps like everybody else. Um, and then we come in in the morning and we can see, you know, um, how many upvotes the, the request has had, how many people are working on it and things like that. Um, the other place that, you know, obviously we hang out a lot in is, you know, in open source spaces. Um, so GitHub is a great place to come give us feedback as well, um, right? Any one of our, you know, MRTK uh, type projects, you know, like the, we, 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 we pay a lot of attention to that. Um, and we're quite a lot on Reddit as well, um, looking and perusing Reddit to see, you know, what are people in the developer community doing? Um, those are kind of the async ways that uh, are giving us information. Um, but there's also the, all of the conversations we have, right? If you think about Jesse, who many of you know, if you think about the MVPs, if you think about people like yourself, our regional directors, um, the idea of having this is so we have listening folks throughout the world, in a sense, that are engaging with our developer community. And through these conversations is how we ultimately come up with, you know, feature set um, for where to work on, where are the gaps, and how do we prioritize work? Nice. So you mentioned yesterday in your keynote that, you know, WebXR support with Firefox reality um, is about dude, to dude, happen. Or actually happen. emojis for that? I... Yeah, can we get some love for it? Because I love it, definitely, because WebXR definitely improves the reach uh, for developers as well as consumers. So yes. That's, that's awesome. But I actually, I wanted to turn around the question a little bit. I mean, it's awesome that we can build basically a whole app in web tech. Uh, but what about if we want to bring in small portions of the web into our applications? And that happens often when we build an app, for example, enterprise applications. They want to show like a website inside your application. Like think about a dashboard or mm -hmm. whatever, right? They already totally. have built that. So, so you want to have a little web view window. And the web view 2 um, is, is coming. There's a web view 2 preview. 
uh, with Chromium support, which is now mm -hmm. available. Um, basically, the question is, when can we expect something like that on the HoloLens? Basically, when will WebView 2 land for the HoloLens? Yeah, so, you know, you see our journey about embracing web, more web development and more web frameworks into HoloLens being a huge priority for us, right? So, um, again, it's just a sequence of time. But you saw with the announcements yesterday that you just mentioned that we're definitely pushing in that direction. And that's kind of the commitment. I don't have any new announcements to make today. We made them kind of yesterday. Um, but that kind of frame of we are going to be doing a lot more work to do a lot more support for web frameworks, both within exclusive apps in Unity and Unreal, um, as well as, you know, things outside, um, is very much something that, you know, you should think is a, it's a big focus of ours. And you're just going to see, you know, that increase. Now, having browsers hosted within an exclusive app, Unreal or Unity, is something everybody requests. So in the world of <laughs> you don't need to tell us you need it, it's top of our list. Um, now, it's actually a lot of work, right? Um, and uh, the move that we did as a company to move Microsoft Edge, our web browser, to be Chromium-based, which was a mammoth work item, um, was kind of the focus of that team. We partnered deeply with that team to bring you know, the <laughs> Edge browser, as an example, to HoloLens. Um, that work is behind us, right? If you're not using Edge, you should. It's an amazing browser. It's Chromium-based. And now we're all on the same open source stack uh, for HTML uh, between Google, between us, right? on Chromium, um, which is, should allow us to start, you know, speeding some of this stuff up. Um, you know, so anyways, it's actually a lot of work, short answer, to allow you to host a browser within Unity or Unreal through our UWP stack um, and everything else. Um, so we needed to do a lot of cleanup work. I'll just call it what it is. A lot of cleanup work to even make the conditions true for us to be able to do it. Um, but like, look, internally, it's the top feature request of our developers that are creating experiences that are first party on HoloLens. Externally is a huge feature request we hear from all of you. Um, and it's something we're working on. Nothing to announce today, but um, totally hear the feedback and, you know, stay tuned. And I look forward uh, to that announce uh, someday soon. Nice. All right, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about Azure Mixed Reality Services. Um, Azure Spatial Anchors is now GA. Uh, and the question is, yeah, no for that. that's awesome. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I know a lot of people have been applying it and using it since a year already being in preview and the quality was already amazing, although it's being in, in preview. And so now it's being GA um, for the current platforms. We have iOS, we have Android, we have HoloLens 1 and 2. And so the question is basically, what about an expansion of ASA to all the platforms like Windows Desktop? And, mm. uh, you know, that I can basically use a camera I can connect to my Windows machine and run simple algorithms like the slam and all of that you know are there any plans regarding that um let me say it this way philosophically we are looking at you know all of our mixed reality cloud services as as cross-platform um and now you'll say but alex remote rendering only works on hololens hey azure spatial anchors only works on ios android and hololens um but i just want you to get the theme the theme is we're creating these things with cross-platform in mind and we want them and it's then it's just a matter of time until they start showing up in multiple places now we tend to be very uh signal chasing in terms of how we approach our our our, our cross-platform work if there's only one developer in that platform and it takes us a year to do the work, we're like, we're not going to support that platform. And it's less because of the platform. It's more there's only one developer there and it's a year worth of work. Now, if on the other hand, there were a million developers there and it's a day worth of work, oh my God, we'd be there already, right? I'm giving you two silly bookends, none of which is true, but I want you to understand that then philosophically we chase where the developers are. Um, and we go in sequence. Right, Azure Spatial Anchors, um, with all the work, for example, that's happening on ARKit and ARCore, there's a lot of developers on those platforms. It was a no-brainer to go there. Um, now, ASA, Azure Spatial Anchors, has a requirement that the hosting platform, in a sense, support out of the gate. They have some amount of framework that does slam. Right, Slam, for those that don't know what that is, it's um, an algorithm that has existed since, you know, late 90s called simultaneous localization and mapping. 
Um, it's essentially a way in which you can walk into an environment and look for, for you know, patterns in the environment that allow you, as the name suggests, to localize yourself in it while you're mapping and creating the environment. And then as you walk around, you know, more of the environment gets mapped. And as more of the environment gets mapped, better becomes your ability to localize or relocalize yourself um, into it. Now, Azure Spatial Anchors takes that as the input. Right, those anchors that are get created is what you kind of feed it as input, and then what we do with Azure Spatial Anchors is we allow you to do the simultaneous localization and mapping, but to do it in a way that works across space and time. So you can now do things, you know, that work across arbitrarily large spaces, which Slam by design doesn't do. Um, we allow you to place holograms now that persist through winter, summer. Um, spring and fall the, that persists between you know places that look the same. So you feed it the slam, and then we allow you to have coherence in that map uh, over space and time, and allow people to share in that map so that you can create collaborative experiences. Now, to your point of Windows, Windows as an example doesn't support slam. You don't have on Windows you know devices coming up with sensors in the front or in the back that are doing the equivalent of AR Kit or AR Core. The solution there is this product, I don't know if you heard of it, called HoloLens. <laughs> um, right? It runs Windows. <laughs> it is a Windows, just not a Windows desktop, because I'm like, well, how yeah. much value do we have running Slam on a desktop? If you're us, like, you should be running Slam on a HoloLens. Um, right? But so, you know, yeah, that's why we went to mobile, um, because there it does make sense. You're running around with a phone moving around, um, and we have HoloLens. And we will continue to evaluate other platforms um, to go into for Azure Spatial Anchors, but now you get the theme. It must support Slam. Um, once it supports Slams, we must have enough developers um, and the work you know, has to be commensurate um, to the amount of developer energy that shows up in it. So less developers, less work, good. More developers, more work, okay. Gotcha. Uh, you touched already on it a little bit with Azure Remote Rendering and uh, as you mentioned, it just supports uh, Windows or, well, HoloLens too. Um, can we expect AR for other devices and also follow up question immediately like of course you know azure mood rendering i'm super excited about it because it allows us to have also from division standpoint smaller form factors like smaller mm -hmm. devices with with offloaded computing and so on so um these kind of two questions together like you know can we expect to follow devices and and do you also see basically the next iteration of the hall lens maybe you know completely delegate a lot of the rendering to remote rendering um, great question. So the first one, you got my philosophy now. All of our services are eventually going cross-platform. That's inclusive of Azure's uh, remote rendering. You also understand now how we're going to think about how and where we go. Um, I'm going to get a little bit ahead of the game, although I have nothing to announce today. Um, but you, know, you should expect probably VR is the first next place that we go, the most natural place for us to go with remote rendering before, say, you know, back to Windows desktop type of thing. Um, but you know, same philosophy will approach to it to kind of move it around. Uh, um, now, in terms of, you know, compute and you're like, hey, you know, should we expect? Yeah, to, in, in a sense, if you think about head-mounted displays, I don't care if they're virtual reality devices or if they're augmented reality devices like HoloLens, um, the game is everybody also wants more immersion, more immersion, more immersion. People also want more comfort, more comfort, more comfort. Those things are not... Um, together, they pull against each other. They go this way, right? Um, the more immersion you add, the bigger things get. The more power hungry they get. Um, well, the more comfort you want to get to, the less hardware you can put in, the less battery you can put in, the less horsepower you get. So that's a conundrum. And like any conundrum, you don't give up. Uh, miracles required. You kind of go into it and you invent your way out of it. You know, Azure Remote Rendering, to your point, that's the premise, right? And it's premise based on the feedback from you. Right. It was right away with HoloLens one that that, you know, as we started doing proof of concepts, people are like rendering 100,000 polygons on HoloLens uh, is good for demos. It's not good for mission critical things. You know, my my models for architecture, my models for my building, my models for the human body, my models, my models, my models are like in the millions. So we said, great, we need to solve that. That's not about putting a bigger GPU or more battery or more horsepower. Um, it's about putting stuff in the cloud. And now as soon as you put stuff in the cloud, you're like, how hard could that be, Alex? You know, uh, you got to think about latency. Um, it's not like watching YouTube video where you can like, you know, say, you know, you're just watching video. 
you need to interact with it. You need to press a button and you need to feel reactive on that button. That means that it just round trip from a rendering perspective. And that's the thing that makes it complex is the fact that you're round tripping input through remote rendering um, in that process. So at any rate, um, as soon as you start believing in remote rendering, that gives you the ability to, to your point, do a lot more compute. That could be using a HoloLens 2 with all of its local compute to render an object that has a billion polygons. Right, like we talked about yesterday, more than a billion polygons. Um, or it could mean, you know, doing devices that have a smaller footprint, that are smaller, um, that are more like comfortable glasses. Um, you know, and again, I'm not. I don't think. I actually, I'll, I'll say it. I don't think the next version of Hololens will have no local compute be a thin client. Um, I just don't think that 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 you know latency bandwidth you know 5g any number of things will be pervasive enough to give us enough bandwidth and enough uh, latency where that's going to be good but we are going to start taking more advantage of it right judiciously on what it makes sense for global products across the world um, but if you were to ask me alex how about five hollow lenses from now um, right, and, and again, I'm not announcing the five HoloLenses from now, but like you should expect five HoloLenses from now, even if we're not doing it, someone else will be, right? So the idea that this intelligent cloud will more and more couple with infinite intelligent edges, there's still intelligence on the edge, there's still compute on the edge, but that you're creating essentially complementary workloads um, in leveraging things like rendering power of the cloud in order to do more immersion on the client, um, yeah, that is definitely the trend that I am certainly pushing our ecosystem towards. Um, but you have to be judicious, right? You still need a HoloLens working offline. Um, we have many scenarios where there is no connectivity and there's not going to be any connectivity. Um, even if you do have connectivity, we have to think about it on a global scale, um, you know, from emerging markets to developed markets. And you just kind of have to skate to where the technology is going to be able to support the feature. Um, but, you know, give us when we turn 40, uh, when HoloLens turns 40, I'm pretty sure it's going to primarily be rendered in the cloud. Awesome. Glad um, to hear that. And you also already touched on the next question I had, you know, the future vision and kind of things. Like you mentioned, it's kind of contradicting form factor, computing power, price, all of that works against each other. So you got to find a good middle ground. Um, the uh, what, what do you think is the, the biggest challenge that we need to overcome to bring the uh, technology to widespread consumer adoption? I think there's a lot, to be honest. I don't think there's kind of one thing. If only that thing got fixed, we'd be fine. Uh, I think it's a journey. And I think it's a path-dependent journey. Look, I think that uh, mixed reality, virtual reality, augmented reality is a medium, right? It's A, it's a spectrum. It goes from virtual reality to augmented reality and everywhere in between. Um, but, you know, you need to be path-dependent on the choices you make, I think. Um, where, you know, I'm just going to say it. Uh, consumers are the hardest ones. Um, everybody's hard. There's a lot of work, but like you know, making a consumer product. Um, when you think about share of wallet, when you think about value inside a product, um, when you think about social acceptance of it, um, you know, if you're using something for entertainment, you know, your bar is much higher. Uh, in a sense, for you know, why would you put it on your head? If on the other hand, it makes something go from I cannot do this be and I cannot do this before, but I can do this now that workload has tremendous amount of value, you'll put up with putting something bigger in your head as long as it works and as long as it solves the problem. Um, so I do think that we still have immersion to work through. Now, immersion is not just big size of field of view. Um, I'm, I'm going to say the field of view for HoloLens 2 is fine to, as an entry point um, for a consumer device, perhaps. Um, but when I say immersion, it's everything. It's how you interact with holograms. is the quality of the holograms. Um, how do they look? What is the feature like? There's a bunch of stuff that goes into immersion that I think we still need to make progress on for a consumer product. And I think comfort. Um, and I'm going to put social access, accepts, acceptability as part of the comfort bit. Um, there's work to be done, right? Um, it's the difference oh, yeah. between yeah. goggles and glasses. Um, <laughs> like, I am mega proud of how beautiful HoloLens 2 is, but we embrace that as goggles. We never try to design glasses. We embrace that at this weight, at this comfort, um, it's silly to be glasses. As a matter of fact, I think glasses are silly right now um, for people that are trying to do it. For that reason, they're uncomfortable devices. Um, that's so you need to do a lot of comfort work because here's what I do think 
I think for consumers, showing up with anything but glasses is not going to work. Um, you might get some enthusiastic people, you know, enthusiastic people by HoloLens 2 today, um, right? Or we'll be able to start doing it in July. Um, if you talk consumer proper, consumer scale, right? Um, you're not going to have people putting goggles on. See virtual reality. Virtual reality is, I think, in consumer space. But like, again, um, in my mind, it's not a consumer scale. It is a consumer product, not a consumer scale. And I think a lot of the comfort is it. You know, how many people here have spent more than, more than two hours inside of VR? Um, raise your hands. Not a lot of emojis. Some, you're in alt space. That's probably the only place in VR where that happens. Um, how many people have spent a day inside of VR? Right, so um, a few people oh, again in all space. In all space, you will get that, um, but in most other places, that's that's, <laughs> that's hard. The devices are uncomfortable, yeah. right? Um, so immersion um, is a huge part. Comfort is a huge part, and then lastly, it's value. You need to go discover what that value is um, in a durable way, where you would say, "Hey, I want to do this every day." And doing this every day in this medium is better than either I couldn't do it before. I'm doing something brand new. Or it is massively better than using my phone or using my PC or my tablet or anything else like that. And those three things, the right level of immersion, the right level of comfort, and the right level of value, need to match in a value equation that you're like, there's enough value to price point what, how much tech I put in this thing where people would actually spend the money to go do it uh, to hit that sweet spot. So, you know, consumers are definitely in our future. Um, I love consumers, but we've been super thoughtful, rightfully so, I think, um, on how we've paced it um, and how we've, we've paced the journey and how we've created path-dependent choices that allow us as an ecosystem to learn, allows us as an ecosystem to grow, allows us as an ecosystem to monetize things um, before technology is necessarily ready for mass market consumerism. Gotcha. The, um, in the past, Microsoft talked about uh, Windows Holographic as an operating system, which is Windows Mixed Reality, right? And right now, we have WinMR on immersive devices uh, that, you know, full parties can basically license out and build their own WinMR headsets. And now, uh, what about, like, you know, applying that model to the whole lens? And that's what we heard in the past is, like, basically, you're going to license out the technology that other OEMs can build their own HoloLens devices, if you will. And another... A little thing, I saw the, the uh, CEO from Unreal, uh, he tweeted out a photo together with you a while ago. And uh, is there something you guys are working on? Uh, what's, what's happening in that space? Um, so to answer your first question, uh, and then I'll answer the second one. At Mobile World Congress last year, you know, we had what I think was, was a very uh, poignant moment, a uh, very important moment for, for the industry, um, where if you look at the industry, you, we have to decide what we want the ecosystem or this industry to be about. And uh, as leaders in mixed reality, you know, the choice we make, I think, is, is quite important because that means other people, as they enter the space, even competitors, they're going to have to chase you. Um, if you're leading, right? Otherwise, they're not going to be able to uh, compete. And in a sense, we made a huge statement last year around the tenor that we want for the mixed reality platform. As a matter of fact, I did it by inviting Tim Sweeney, um, who's the CEO of Epic, um, on stage with me to announce the idea that we are making a durable statement um, for mixed reality that we are going to hashtag open. Um, we're an open ecosystem. We are not going to be a walled garden. Um, which is if you look at most other platforms out there, they're walled gardens, they're closed ecosystems. I personally think that's actually not good for innovation. I don't think that that's good when you center all of the kind of profiteering in, in just, just one small pool um, by essentially making people pay tax and adding speed bumps to developers and innovators in the value chain. So we said, look, we're not going to do that for mixed reality. In mixed reality, developers are going to have the freedom to bring their own browsers. I'm not going to say, you know, why are browsers locked in ecosystems? Because that's how you monetize search. You know, the monetization comes by the, the default browser. Um, so you say, if I'm the only browser in town on my closed platform, well, then it all funnels through me. And we said, no, 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 we are not going to do that with, with HoloLens. We're not just going to have Microsoft Edge as the only browser. It's there. It's Chromium-based. It's amazing. But we're going to give developers the freedom to bring their own browsers as first-class citizens into our platform. See Firefox Reality, 
boom, we announced that last year. You saw us coming to Bear now. We also said the same thing for app stores. We said, look, developers will have the freedom to have their own app stores within HoloLens. Um, of course, we're going to have the Microsoft Store. But if you think about monetization again, um, you know, I, I get to charge, you know, however many percent points for every app in my app store. Um, and if I'm the only app store in town, you have no choice. There's no other way for you to get applications inside of HoloLens. We said, no, no, no. Developers can bring their own app stores and their own monetization schemes um, and do whatever they want. It's open. And then finally, which is really the answer to your question, Renee, um, we said, look, and we're going to also give developers the freedom to create their own devices. Um, as long as they meet the right sensor spec and the right capabilities, um, they can bring their own headset um, that has the same functionality um, that we have on HoloLens. And again, nothing to announce today, folks. Um, I would have announced it yesterday if we're going to announce it, but I want you to understand the philosophy. This hashtag open runs deep, and it's a durable commitment that we've made. Um, and, you know, the first proof positive you've seen yesterday on the browser side with Firefox coming to town, um, we don't have a non-Microsoft app store to announce yet, but it's an open platform that people can go do, and I look forward to the day that more app stores start showing up on, on, on our our, uh, uh, ecosystem. And um, to your point, um, you know, we're huge on OpenXR, right? We're driving and spearheading ahead of everybody else the OpenXR standards in order to continue to drive across virtual reality and augmented reality the ability for the ecosystem to innovate. And then I'll close um, to answer your second question. Um, and then we should probably close the whole fireside chat on the Unreal conversation. I love everybody in our space, man. I don't think anybody is a competitor. Um, there's another quote that I love, which, you know, imagine for a minute what we could accomplish as a species if it didn't matter who got credit for it. Apply that to our ecosystem of mixed reality. My God, folks, across all of us, name anybody in the space. There's not more than 10 million devices out there. Um, there's more than a billion phones. You guys are all good at math. You know how many orders of magnitude were off of each other? Um, why am I competing across like some 10 million thing? This thing is going to be more than a billion devices at some point, right? So in a sense, is how do we band together as an ecosystem um, to help each other, to accelerate the journey? You know, I, I kidded with the uh, Unreal CEO. I'm like, look, when one of us is selling more than 100 million devices a year, then maybe we can start competing with each other. Until then, competition is a silly exercise, right? So I talk to everybody and anybody in the ecosystem. Um, that, that wasn't any special conversation. There's no secrets that we haven't announced yet. It was just a cordial call. Um, he knew about us. He had been following us. You know, he actually um, got the inspiration for Unreal because of HoloLens. Um, and he said, can I come meet you guys? Um, I said, oh, my God, it'd be our pleasure. Um, I'm in love with their product. I think they have a very good product and market. Um, I wish them all the best and, you know, success. Um, and you'd be surprised. I think there's very few um, people in the space that I don't know, that I haven't visited, that I haven't talked to. Um, some are more social media friendly than others. Um, I'm open, man. Um, so he was like, can we take a selfie? I'm like, God bless you. As long as I can retweet it, we're all set. Um, and it was a great conversation. He's uh, an amazing human. And, you know, I love, again, to see the progress and, you know, anything we can do to help anybody in the ecosystem, inclusive of Unreal. Um, you know, I, for people that remember, uh, when I announced HoloLens for the very, very, very first time, January 21st, uh, you know, 2015. In that very, the, HoloLens didn't even exist, nor did anybody else in the market. Um, all of these things came after 2015. Then in that speech, you can look it up, it's on YouTube. Um, I said, I invited everybody to come work with us. Um, even back then, that this idea of like, look, let's bend together. Let's who cares who gets credit for it. Let's accelerate the ecosystem runs deep in our team and it runs deep in the work that we do. Um, and, you know, and Rio was in that context. Awesome. So looking at the time, I think we could have these conversations for hours. And uh, like you said, like wearing a VR headset for the whole day. I mean, um, for a conversation, I would do that. Um, <laughs> but I mean, th <laughs> thanks so much. Alex, uh, is there anything else you would like to share with this group uh, before we uh, close this thing off? Absolutely. Um, I want to close like I always start with heart.
hearts. Um, hearts behind me, hearts above me, hearts all around. Um, I want to close with gratitude. Um, first, I want to gratitude to you, Renee. Thank you so much for hosting this panel today. Thank you for staying up, um, you know, late in Europe to be able to be with us here in the morning um, in the United States. You know, thank you for all the work canvassing questions um, from the community. Look at all the love from the community to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and then I want to end with gratitude for all of our developers and everybody who's here in MR Dev Days or, you know, just came to hang out. Um, you know, we create this um, for you. And um, in a sense, you know, I'm just so grateful. Again, the whole team, I spoke with a lot of people on the team. They're energized talking to you. Um, you know, I, I know everybody's busy um, and doing other things. So I'm just incredibly grateful for you showing up, for you engaging with us, for you giving us feedback, um, and for us to continue working together to accelerate this journey. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, enjoy the rest of MR Dev Days, and I hope to see each of you super soon. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, we really appreciate it. You took the time out of your busy schedule. Uh, thanks, everyone, for showing up. I hope that was a valuable use of my time. For me, it definitely was. Um, I hope we can see each other in the networking space that is open now. Uh, we have a 40-minute break. And after that, all the ton of amazing sessions will continue uh, for the second day of the MR Dev Days. Um, take care, everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy, and see you around. Bye. Bye-bye.